Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We see that um, you know, we have a uh, uh, reduced number of uh, hello students in class today for some reason. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, so today, if everything goes uh, plans, what we are going to do is to uh, first uh, go back to week uh, five. Week six, I think. We had classes with resources, right? Copy construction, copy assignment. And see how that behaves when you have inheritance. OK? So classes with resource, and now it's derived classes with resource. The concept is very simple. Uh, but again, as usual, I'm going to do a quick review from what we have done down to this point. We'll come up and we get to it. The concept itself, covering the, the concept itself and telling you what we need to be careful about when you have inheritance and dynamic memory allocation at the same time, what you need to do, that's a very short message. Just remember, we've got to go from the beginning. And then, uh, if time serves us, as it did in the other class, we're going to start learning how to make C++ write code for us. So we don't write code. C++ writes it for us. OK, we're going to learn how to do that. OK? We're going to learn when specific logic applies to many different types. Why do you have to keep overloading functions or overloading classes? Not over to create new classes for it. We can just tell to the compiler, hey, this is the logic. Please write it for whatever type that I'm going to use in future. We're going to uh, go through that one. Before anything begins, again, it was uh, uh, one of those things that we had to celebrate here with uh, friends and family till like 1 o'clock in the morning. Usually, uh, it, 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 with, with this new year, is a little uh, tricky because it's not at the same time. They really I don't know how people did it 800 years ago, but they actually calculate the exact revolution of the Earth around the sun. And at the precise time, that's the time that the year changes. So sometimes it's 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But so last night they had to say, that's why you see me a little, uh, I'm a little hangover because of too much wine and too much food. All right. My apologies on that. OK, now that we have uh, all these things set aside, let's quickly go back to what we have done uh, down to this point. First, Earth got cold, and then uh, dinosaurs ate too much and died. And then programmers started programming, and came the animal kingdom. Okay? So we said that. Uh, uh, to learn inheritance and understand how, uh, oh, before we do anything, remember rule of three, right? Rule of three was to uh, make sure that, actually, give me one of the rule of three. Copy constructor. Copy constructor. The other one? Copy assignment. And then the other one? Destructor. So the destructor that after going through all these uh, virtuality and stuff like that, we learned that destructors are something that it's a good practice to put it for every single class that we create, even if we don't want it and we make it virtual. If you don't want a destructor in a class, you just set it to default. You say equal to default, which means uh, I want to just have a virtual destructor in this thing. I don't want to do anything. So you can do that. So that's rule of three that we have to do. Just remember that. We talked about inheritance, and we said if we want to create a new class out of an already existing class, what we do, we create the class in the root column, and then public animal. What happens over here, that becomes an animal, is a relationship, is what we have. By the way, everybody saw the posting on, the, on Microsoft Teams, right? that you have a quiz, and I send you the links for all the topics that it's going to cover. 
the next day you're coming for your lab. Remember that. Everything's, everything's back to normal. Okay? So, uh, so I, I posted it on Microsoft Teams with the links of what the topics are like that you have to go through for the quiz to get ready. Anyway, so, uh, we, we did that one, and uh, we found out that when you create a new class out of an already existing class, it actually extracts all the, it actually reuses or brings in all the features of, an, of the old class into the new class that you have either direct access or indirect access to it. All, all the base class has that is protected and private is accessible to the children, and the private ones are, are accessible directly by children, by the derived class, and the, uh, uh, all the private parts are accessible indirectly by the uh, derived class using accessors of accessors and mutators of the, of the class. So we, we uh, remember that. The problem came through when we actually have uh, the base class, like the, the problem uh, came, uh, like the, it became obvious that doing all these inheritance stuff, we're going to be in trouble if we have a derived class pointed by a base class. We said uh, we did all the effort and we put all the, uh, our thoughts into creating a, a, a new, more object from the already existing class, but when I ha use the old pointer of the derived class, uh, uh, of the base class, and point to the derived class, the derived class forgets that it was the, uh, it is the, uh, the, the, the new class forgets that it was the new class. It acts like it's the base class, as if nothing was new. And that sucked. We didn't like it. And problem even, uh, became serious when you deleted the, the derived class using the, using the, hello, using uh, the base class. And that created dynam uh, um, created uh, memory leak because it forgets that it's the child class, only the base class, the, uh, the, the parent class gets removed from the memory and the rest remains and therefore we have memory leak. That was when we said we have to remember. And then we went to the uh, next stage to find out how we can actually make the, the, uh, the new uh, changes uh, become applicable no matter how we refer to the object. And we found out that you can't do anything in the derived class to do that. So your derived class, whatever it is, your derived class, whatever it is, has no control to make uh, the class remember everything, even if it's called by a family name. We found out that the only way to make an upgrade stick is to be done, to be foreseen when you are creating the base class, which is creating the method you want upgradable to be anything that is virtual, and we set the interview uh, uh, definition of uh, a virtual method is an action that, uh, it's, it's, an action that it's uh, uh, a method that guarantees that the latest version of it be, is, will be called in the hierarchy of ref, uh, inheritance no matter how the object was uh, accessed. So we said if we have a derived class pointed by a base class and or referred to by base class and I use the base class called to call the action, if the action is virtual, it's guaranteed that the latest version of the method is called, which means the most derived one. Okay? If you do not want something to get improved and you want to make sure that it always remains the way it is when it is being called as a base class, you don't make it virtual. And what is mandatory to, to be done is make the destructor of the base class virtual. Two rules. The destructor must be virtual and it must exist. So even if the class 
doesn't have any resources and it doesn't need a destructor, you must create an empty destructor and uh, take care of the possibility that in future it might actually cause memory leak. So that was that. So we came down to that point and finally right at that point we found out that sometimes when you are creating a base class you are 100% sure that the base class that you have requires actually a specific action to be taken but that action is not 100% certain it's not a hundred that action cannot be implemented because it may vary based on the level of inheritance and we gave you the example of humans talking okay um, and we said each person talks in a different way we know a person can talk but we cannot implement talking for a person until we inherit that person and give it specific type of culture and ethnicity so we know what is the mother tongue so I can actually implement the talking of the person but if you're saying can someone can a, can a human being talk the answer is yes how we don't know we have to see what type of a human being we have in future okay because of that we can enforce that thing and with animals we gave you the example with sound we say any animal can make a sound but the sound that it makes depends on what type of animal we have and then we went to the cat and the dog and we said cat says meow dog says wolf so those type of virtual functions that not only guarantees that the latest version is called but also guarantees that the latest version actually exists so with a regular virtual function you can choose to improve it if you don't nothing goes wrong right but a pure virtual function if you don't implement it your class becomes unreal your class is not uh, a, a, a real class it's a it's just an idea it becomes what we call an abstract base class and if you implement it then it becomes a concrete class a concrete class is a class that can get instantiated so that's where we went and then after that we found out that so at this point, the concept of abstract-based classes end in C++. We don't need to teach anything more. But we found out that in object orientation, a special type of abstract-based class is named specifically as an interface. And we said an interface is an abstract-based class that does not have any function other than pure virtual methods and obviously an empty uh, destructor that is uh, virtual. And we call that an interface. An interface does not exist in C++. It's just an abstract base class, but in other languages do. I made a mistake with Java. The other time I, I mentioned that Java cannot have an abstract base class, and if it is, it has to only be an interface. Apparently it's not. And So, so uh, I made a mistake. Uh, they can have uh, uh, abstract based classes, but Java also has an interface. You can literally write interface animal, which means it forces you not to have anything other than pure virtual methods. C++ doesn't have that one. C++ doesn't care uh, if, if, if you have uh, at least one pure virtual method, it's an abstract based class. Are we good? After doing that thing, we showed you the, uh, the whole thing, G gave you an example of the whole system of the classes, and we see this class. No, not this. No, no, no. We didn't talk about that, did we? What happened to my. Oh, this one is the one. So we create the whole hierarchy of the things, and I ask you to please go and fiddle around with it, write messages in it, change different type of things, go through it, and see what happens when you refer to a body as an animal with a series of inheritance, and then refer to a body as a pet, and refer to a body as a bird. Will it make any difference? We found out that if the very first one is virtual, 
then it has its own hierarchy. You don't actually need to mention virtual for anything else. It's a transitive thing. When the first one becomes virtual, everything becomes virtual right after that. Every overload becomes virtual. And that's where we end all the, we, where we, the, when we ended everything. And now we're going to actually investigate and see what the devil's going to happen in the hierarchy of inheritance if I actually have classes with resource. So for that, I'm not going to create a class with resource. What I'm going to create is a class that implements the rule of three. That's all I need to know. When I have rule of three implemented, what happens when the an inherited class is actually instantiated? I want to trace that and understand how things happen. When I understand that, when I know how an abstract, uh, 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 an inherited class instantiated, how it's going to get copied, how it's going to get uh, assigned to another one, then I will know what do we have as a, uh, uh, what do we need to be concerned about. To do that, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to create a base class, a very simple base class. And I'm going to put all different types of uh, uh, things a base class can do and just put messages in it. So essentially, I'm going to create a base class, and I put a member variable over there. As you see, this class does not have a resource at all outside of it. It just has an integer inside, right? So then what I'm doing in here, I'm creating a default constructor, and then I'm going to say defaulted. So I just want to see what happens. And obviously, because that is instantiated, uh, that is initialized, it's going to be zero. Now in the base class, I'm going to set it to something, and I'm going to say a base constructor with this value, and I'm going to call the copy because a base is getting copied, setting this value to that value, so I can exactly see uh, what is being copied. So, so, and then I'm going to uh, create an operator equal, and I'm going to base copy assignment, copying this one to that one, so I know what is being over. So a perfect way of going through everything and make sure everything is fine. And I'm just dropping an operator equal over here to remember that. Uh, 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 an assignment at the moment of creation is, with an integer is, uh, is completed what we are doing uh, with a constructor. So this, is, this has nothing to do with rule of three. It's just there to uh, remind you of uh, some aspects. So this is just an assignment, base assignment, and this one is a copy assignment. And finally, at the end, we're going to have a virtual destructor that shows that the object is being destroyed. And, uh, a standard write function to overload the write function with a, uh, an operator to print it so we can actually uh, see how the base class is getting printed and so on and so forth. Doing that, if I create a base class, Like this, so I'm going to create, oh, this is not NAA, this is ZAA, and I don't even need that one. Okay, so when I create a base class, okay, I'm going to say base B is equal to 124. So at line, let me just write two of them, bless you, and uh, let me write two of them so I can actually ask questions on that. So tell me, and I'm going we know this is, these are all just dummy stuff. They're not doing something. It, it's just standard stuff. So I'm just going to uh, kind of uh, collapse them so we can, we can just see what they are, and that's it. OK? Having, have, having had that one at line 41, what, which line is going to be called at line 41? One argument, nine. Nine will be called. It's not going to call 22 that is operator equal. That's a, a common mistake. Assignment at the moment of creation is a call to one argument, one argument constructor and not uh, the assignment operator. We know that, right? And then I'm going to have over here base created, which creates a, 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 a base, it defaults a base. Uh, the reason I have new lines over here is that I don't print uh, the new line, and I was lazy to keep typing that, so I did an L like that. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, 
I should have actually defined that into NL only, so I don't have to write the parentheses, but I wasn't smart enough at the time. OK. So when I run the program, this is what happens. I'm not going to even go and walk through it. I'm just going to show you the messages. Debugging is true. Yes, deb it's animal. I forgot that I should actually set it to uh, this one as a startup project. Sorry. I start set a startup project. OK, I'll stop it, and then I'll do that. Set as startup project. And one more time. OK, so it comes over here. As you see, it says, base constructor 123 and that's what it creates then it's going to say base default that is default then it's when i do this it's going to say base copy assignment 0 to 123 so it's essentially put whatever is in b in, in c and then it it shows the base to 123 and shows the base 123 again okay and when it actually uh goes out it kills them in reverse order so as soon as the program ends, the two destructors are called back to back in reverse order. Okay? Problem down to this point? Are we okay? All right. I could do something over here if you're not going to get confused, hopefully. So I could actually come over here for copy constructor. I can say it's equal to minus one, just to remember that anything that's getting copied, it loses a value. You know what I mean? Just to see the difference between the two. Obviously, that's not a real thing, OK? And I'm going to say anything that's going to get assigned, copy assigned, I'm going to, it's going to be added by one, OK? So we can actually see. Uh, so in here, I'm going to say plus one, something like that. So, so like this, I can actually trace it. Now, if I run the exact same thing again, I can see actually which one is created for what reason. So I can actually come over here and say that's the base created, and this is the other one created. Now it's being assigned, so it's 124, as you see. It means it's copy assignment. Now I know which one is the coffee. So the coffee. I would love to have a coffee right now. But anyways, so now if I actually print B, I know B is the original one, and the other one is the copy. And when they get destroyed now, I can detect it's actually in reverse order. OK? So the one that is less, that's copy. The one that is one more, that's uh, assignment. Remember that. Are we good? Are we OK down to this point? All right. So now we're going to actually start deriving the classes. And, uh, and I'm going to actually create a, a inherit, uh, do some inheritance over here and see how things work like that. So I'm going to inherit the class into what I call a derived class. OK? So for the derived class of mine, I have a property of my own. OK? And I'm going to say, uh, out derived default. It, it defaults that one. Now I'm going to, so as you see, I am not mentioning anything about the base class. So in this scenario, I'm showing I just did everything that I'm supposed to do with uh, my, uh, what shall we call it, the, with, uh, um, I, I did the inheritance with my derived class, but I am not mentioning how the base class is supposed to be copied, nothing. I'm not mentioning anything, OK? And doing so, I'm going to try and trace and see what happens if I actually inherit, uh, inherited, uh, uh, 
create an instance of the inherited class and see what happens when I do not mention what happens uh, with the base class. Is it automatic? Will it work? So, and for this, now, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did with the other one. But for the derived class, what I will do, I'm going to reduce it with 10 when it's copied. And I'm going to increase it by 10. when it's assigned. Same thing with the other one. Oh. Stupid compiler. OK. OK, so <laughs> OK, that's that. It's very simple and straightforward. And I write the, and I'm going to, the only thing that I do over here, the only thing that the derived class is doing with the base is that when it's writing the derived class, it's calling the base's write to, so I know what I have in my base. OK? So, and we know that we do not need to, and we know that we do not need to redo the uh, operator overload. Because the operator overload works this one, and the right is, oh, the right is not virtual. So it would have been nice to see it doesn't work. <laughs> I just detected the problem over here. So if I actually run this right now, it's, uh, it's not going to even show the derived class because I forgot to make the right virtual. Okay. So I'll make the right virtual. Should I call, run it, and see what happens, and then fix it? OK. So now in my main, uh, oh, shoot. Copy. Let me pause for a second. So let's go over the. <laughs> Yes, what I'm saying is that uh, we inherited uh, a class out of another one, and we implemented rule of three in both. The only thing is that in the second one, I did not mention what the base one is supposed to do with respect to rule of three. The only thing that I have is overloading, overriding the right class of the base and calling the right class of the base in the right class of the derived not having the right class of the base virtual. We will we'll see that when I run the program. Should stop it first. When I'll see when I run the program. It actually, uh, for the constructor, I have no choice. So it's just base default class. Let's go through the thing so we'll see exactly what's happening over here. First one is line number seven. When you create a, a derived class, and I'm setting it to 123, one argument constructors, but how is the base created? Defaulted, right? The base is defaulted. That's that sucks. Okay, um, I might want I might want to pass something from the the right. To the, I can't. I'm not doing that. For the second one that I'm drawing default, they are both defaulted. Then it says derive assign zero to one thirty three because it adds one to it. So that means that's assignment. But when I'm printing, they are both base zero. So it's not actually. At the end, everything is dying. Okay. So this has problem. Base zero, base zero is supposed to show the base and the drive. The reason it's not doing it is that the, is that the right is not set to virtual to be upgradable. So if I come back over here and just take a look at what we have in here, I'm not going to uh, remove it. I'm just going to make this virtual and re rerun it. We'll see exactly the outcome is going to come, but now this time it's going to actually show the, the values that I need to see. OK? So as you see, the base class remains defaulted at all times. OK? Uh, and that's the assignment. Now, let's actually do the copy construction and see what happens. What if I actually 
do it like this. And I'm going to say sh void show. Or actually, let's, let's do it even like this. That, 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 that creates too many destructive stuff. So in here, uh, the E, I'm going to say derived F. And I'm going to set that one to D. OK? And in here, I'm going to say F and L. And I run the program again. We know that is assignment, assignment at the moment of creation is actually Assignment at the moment of creation is actually uh, 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 a constructor. And because it's the same object, it's copy construction. Therefore, when we come over here and we look at the execution, OK? Oh, I forgot to put a new line. My apologies. Now let's analyze it. Line number 70, the constructor is called. Line number 72, the default is called. And line number 74, the copy is called. I have leak all over the place because the base is just being defaulted. <laughs> Nothing is being copied in it. Do you see that? And when I print the rest, you see what happens. What is the message here? The message is this. I'll, let me actually show you another thing. <clears throat> now, I'm going to remove the rule of three. I'm going to remove the rule of three from the derived class. OK? So now, in the case that they both have everything implemented, we see that it doesn't work. I have to add my own touch to make sure everything works. That's number one. So when you implement everything, when you implement anything, you have to implement all the way through. If you are implementing the assignment operator, you should take care of the assignment oper operator of the parent. If you are doing the constructor, you have to take care of everything. You have to take care of it properly yourself. OK? But what happens if I do not? What happens if I, if I do not implement the rule of three? So of course, I cannot not implement the destructor. That's going to be there. So the copy assignment and uh, the copy constructor are removed now. Right? Let me run it again and see what happens. Oh, actually, let's do something else. Give me a second. And also, I'm going to set up my base class, too. So I'm going to say, when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, 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 creating it with single integer, I'm going to pass that one to the base class, too. So I'm going to set up the base class, too. In here, I'm going to say, I'm going to say base D, OK? You know for a fact that if you look to a recent thing, this is what you see, not the other one, right? It's the same, right? Remember that. This is the new notation, OK? So just to make sure that I see what's happening to the base class, I'm going to do the same. So for default, I presume everything wants to get defaulted. I'm not going to mention anything. Because you don't mention anything at line 41, the base will be defaulted. Are we OK with that? In line number 44, I am initializing the y number variable with d, but I'm passing that value to base 2. So base will hold the same value as the right one. And then it continues with the rest. But the difference over here is, uh, so let's just, just to see what the difference is. Now I'm going to uh, run it as it was before with that constructor so we can see what the difference is. So this is no change. I just set the, the constructor to work properly so we can see what happens over here. So as you see over here, now the base is constructed properly. So base is 123, derive is 123. That's good. Base is defaulted, derive is defaulted. That's good. Number three. Because it copies, 
but the base didn't get copied, right? And when I look at uh, uh, this one is base derive. Yeah, so that's D that is getting printed. But as you see the copy assignment and uh, uh, copy constructed, they didn't work. The 123 in base is not copied. <laughs> Correct? So that's problem. We can't have that one. Right? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. And when everything dies, they die, die in reverse order. We know that with them. So now let's remove, and I'm going to keep this over here. I'm going to remove the copy construction and copy assignment from the derived one. Okay? Coming back over here, and I'm going to run it. See what happened. You see that? So for this one, it's saying base constructor because I have it. That's fine. That's line number 70. Line number 72, I am defaulting. That's fine. But take a look. In this one that I'm doing copying, it says the base is being copied. You see that? And when you actually look at all the copies, the copies are working properly. Because the derived ones are copied. You see that? The derived ones are assigned. They are not added because I, could, I did not change it. I did it by default. Which means it really assigns it. Nothing is added. Nothing is removed as we set for all the other ones. As you see, the base copy assignment and copy constructor is called properly. What does it mean? It means if you are deriving a class from a base class with resources, and in the derived one you don't have resources, don't do anything. Everything will work perfectly. Why? Because when you do not mention how the object is going to get copied, compiler says, I'm going to call the copy myself. It calls the copy of the base, which you have modified. Therefore, the proper copy is called. Then it calls the copy of the derived one, which you do not implement it, which is the, uh, the systems, which means it's a blind copy of all the attributes. So everything's going to work. The exact same thing with assignment operator. When you are doing copy assignment, you are assigning one to another. It says, you didn't say it. I'm going to call everything by default. It calls the bases because you modified it. The proper one is called. And it calls the derived one because it's not implemented. The default one is called. Therefore, everything gets assigned blindly, one uh, attribute wise. Every, all the attributes, are, so everything works properly. So. That means the live classes with resources only has this message to you. If the derived one doesn't need to apply rule of three, don't do anything, everything will work. Okay? Even you don't need to create a destructor for it. Why? Because the base class has a virtual destructor as per the rule that we have. Therefore, all the destructors will become virtual, even if you don't mention it. But it, it just in a safe side, it's better to put that thing over there just to be, uh, sleep well at night. Okay, that's 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 the only thing. Okay, but you still you so that's a thing. If in a derived class you don't have any resources, don't touch anything. Don't worry about anything. Everything is going to work perfectly. Do we understand that? Number two, anything that you take over, you have to take over the entire process. Okay, so this one I'm going to say B, so A is done, yes, yeah. so B, I'm going to say derive class with no resource dot CPP, okay? I hope I'm getting somewhere, are we okay? Anybody over here is confused, like, hoo hoo? No? We're good? We okay? Are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay? <laughs> okay.
Now, now what we're going to do, let's take a look. We're going to say, let's start with copy. So I'm going to say, I'm going to bring back the copy. So how do I want to do the copy? It doesn't matter. Do whatever the business logic dictates. If you say, when it's getting copied, I want that one argument constructor to be called. Invoke it. It doesn't matter. It's a constructor. This is the initialization area. Initialize the parts of the arrive any way you want. Just make sure you have the proper order, which means first you have to call the, uh, 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 ask for the constructor of the base, and then all the attributes in order. That's, that's all, OK? So in this case, I don't want to do anything. I just want the constructor of the base to, be, the, the copy constructor of the base to be called. How do I invoke the copy constructor of the base? Easy. Just say base and pass the derived class into it. Although the base class's reference is a reference of base class, and you are passing a derived class to it, but because you can always refer to a derived class as base, the, 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 base uh, the base copy constructor will only see the base part and take care of that one. Therefore, the copy construction for the base is called. So make sure when you are copying, you take care of that one. OK? And then for the operator equal, what do I do? Same. Operator equal is not a constructor. I cannot. It doesn't have an initialization area, but I have my logic. So I'm going to say over here, if that's the case over here, then I'm going to say call operator equal of uh, the base and pass the derive to it. And how do I call the bases? Base. OK. I see people right over here, they do this. They say base, base, uh, this equals to, to force the equal operator. Don't do stuff like that, OK? Just to call the damn thing. Instead of writing some cryptic code that you have to think, will it work or not? Just remember, every single operator is also has a function face that is exact. You know exactly what you're calling, so you simply say, you're assigning me, and I am assigning th that, whatever it is. Uh, if we are not the same object, then copy my, the other part and do this thing. So both parts will happen properly. Now if I actually run the program, you will see that everything will be taken care of properly because I literally went through it. So it's, it's, now as you see, uh, <clears throat> the base classes copying is actually Increasing, and everything is working perfectly. And at the end, everything is deleted in reverse order, and life is beautiful. I don't have any, like, that's it. That's essentially the, the whole uh, guts of this, this, the topic of the day. There is not, I, remember I told you, like, as soon as we, we, we know what we are doing, it's, it takes five minutes to explain? That's what it is. So all you need to do is to remember when you have a derived class, if the derived class has resources, and you are doing some copying in a copy assignment or copy, co copy constructing and copy assignment, you should take care of the copy constructing and copy assignment of the base too. That's all. If you are not, don't touch it. Everything's going to work. Are we good? Yes. I call, just to make sure that nobody thinks they can call a constructor, I'll, I'll call it invoke. It requests for its execution at the moment of creation. If I say, yes, it calls the constructor, you know what happens? People do this. People do this. That's disaster. They think they are calling the base. But at line, 48, in here you are creating a nameless base that has nothing to do with the current object. A nameless copy base of the base part of the current thing, and at line 48.1, that base is going to die. 
It has nothing to do with the current object. That's why we put it in the initialization area. It calls the basis before it calls itself. Remember, the initialization area happens first, which means when you put like when you put stuff in the initialization area over here, when you so I could have done it like this too. Oh, uh, yeah, actually. So writing something like this, you are telling when this constructor, and this has nothing to do with copy constructor. You can do the exact same thing over here. You can choose which constructor to call in a new, why should I mention this? No. Um, so this is a constructor. Because it's a constructor in the initialization area, that is between the closed parentheses and open curly bracket, you can do stuff before the constructor actually go, goes to work. So as soon as a derive is getting created, before it, this is, this is what happens. So essentially, I think I mentioned this in class last time. So when, by doing this, you have, you have two classes, right? So you have two classes. This is your base class. And this is your derived class, right? That contains the base class inside, right? So as soon as, as soon as, as soon as line 75 is hit, which is, it, so this is D right now. Now F is about to get created, right? So this is what happens. Because we wrote this line, the very first thing the compiler will do is to create enough memory to be able to contain both. That's number one. So poof, the memory is allocated, right? Now it goes to work. It wants to do the red thingy. But I said, before that, do this. What does it do? First, it calls the base copy constructor. So what happens, the base copy constructor, because it doesn't know it's a derive. When you call the base past the derive, it only sees the base part, not the derive part. Therefore, it will copy the base. So that's, that's here, right? And then after this, I'm saying setting, set this one. So now it goes and sets this one and puts whatever is supposed to go in the red part. So all the attributes will be set. Then after that comes back over here, I didn't need to have anything in the constructor now. It's just a message because I like to see it is happening. In reality, such a uh, derived cons uh, constructor, sorry, in reality, such a derived constructor has uh, an empty class, empty body. It doesn't have anything in it. You don't need to put anything in it. So everything is already done. And it comes over here and does that. And you see people even do this, which uh, I want to kill myself. They do this, okay, to call the operator, okay, to do all the things. I don't like that. Um, uh, when it comes to derived classes with resource, I want to do everything in detail. I don't want to call everything that has lots of stuff that has nothing to do with copy construction. Uh, in copy construction, it's impossible to be the same object because a new object is getting created. So this if has nothing to do with anything, okay? Things like that. So that, for those type of reasons, I rather do it manually. But it's just me. So, yeah, that's it. So that's that. Did I answer the question, or you, you're more confused now? <laughs> you're okay. Okay. So that's that. So.
uh, that's how it works out. Uh, any questions about derived classes with resources? Suggestions? Objections? You're just about to ask. You can go. That doesn't, you can tell me. <laughs> He's like, ah. Go. Sure, sure. Forty-seven. Uh huh. In here? No, that's what I call initialization area. You you can call a method inside the parentheses, but not the method itself. Like for example, if you have a helper method that validates MD. Let's say in here I have, that's actually a very good question. Let's say over here int validate int value, something like that, const. I have something like this that what it does is that I pass the MD to it so it can validate it and give me a proper MD. If that is supposed to be done to set this, I can call that in here and say validate. That I can do. I cannot call the validate itself here because that's not initialization. That's a function calling. But if I want to pass a value into the initialization stage, I can always call a function for that because that initialization by itself is a statement. And inside the statement, you can have a function. You can always have a function in front of an assignment, right? That's what happens. So you can put initialization. So let's put it this way to just have an emphasis that this is, this is actually initialization. That's why I like to write the curly bracket syntax for it instead of parentheses because it the French kind of put, puts an emphasis that this is initialization. So validate, I cannot have over here comma validate. That doesn't make sense because it's a function. But inside initialization of MD validate could be called. Does that make sense? All right. But I'm going to remove it because it confused the heck out of everyone who wants to see actually what the code is. So, or, um, yeah, I'm going to remove it. Just remember, that goes back to C. At any place that you, you have a value, instead you can have a function. That explains everything. At any place that I have a value, I can have a function. Right? In here, I can have a function. Okay, any place that I have a value, I can have a function instead. A function that returns a value, obviously. Uh, questions? Suggestions? All right. Uh, another thing that I have to mention, if your base class doesn't have resources, and your derived class does, still you need to call the copy construction and everything of the base. You have to take over of everything. So the, what I said, I really meant it. It's exactly like having, telling you if you create one constructor, you have to take care of all. It's the same thing. So if you have a derived class, and your derived class has resources, but your base class doesn't have anything, you create a copy constructor for the derived one, then you have to manually call the copy constructor of the base, even if it's not implemented, to tell to the compiler, copy the base yourself. Compiler will just call the copy constructor. It doesn't care if it's custom or it's default. It will just call it. Okay? Remember, if you implement it, you have to do it all. If you don't, then the compiler will take care of it. Any other question? And please, don't. I respect that you're saying, I'm just figuring it out. If you knew it, then you wouldn't be a student. So 
please, if you have a question and you think that that question is dumb, leave me. 70% of the class have that question in their mind and they're just not asking it. <laughs> okay, so just ask it. That's, that's usually the reality of the situation. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Do you have to implement it for bird as well or no, just for the animals? Always one before, because one before is supposed to take care of the one before that. You know what I mean? So it's, it's always like a, virtual. It's like a train. Be like it's like a train. You have to always pull the car behind you. You don't need to worry about the car after that. That's going to be pulled by this one. You always worry about the one behind you. Unless you want the two before to be created in some other way. You could actually invoke the constructors, but I have never done such a thing. It doesn't make sense. That means, that means their design was flawed, and you are trying to correct their design, which is never going to happen. Any question one? Yes. Uh, so the just confusing I know I know it's because some other prof again as I mentioned and I'm mentioning it over and over many many times I'm just expressing my taste as a person who have done this 20 years more than two more than you another prof comes he's gonna apply his 20 years of experience and thinking that start this is equal to think it's much more yeah, so the, the, he's going to mention it that way. And it's going to happen over and over and over and in every company that you go. You've been learned to, learn to do something like this. Everything is beautiful. You go to another company, some, some, suddenly everything changes. Okay, I'm not saying which one is better than the other one. To me, I like to see how things happen the way they are. I don't want to remember what the conversion is so I know what's going to get called if I have done that. I don't want that. I want to see. Damn thing is that. I, that's, I want to see what's happening. That's crystal clear. I'm not doing anything. That's all. Okay? No problem. Again, I put all due respect to all those profs who have that thing. Maybe they are 200% better than me and they know what's going on. That's just my taste. And you have your right to have your own taste. Okay? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to invoke as if you have implemented those. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So you are essentially choosing because when you are taking over of the copying in the derive, compiler says you are creating the object. Tell me how to create the, the base one. The base has many different ones. Even if you don't create anything, for a class, the class has a default constructor and a copy, and compiler doesn't know which one to call. Right? So you have to tell the compiler which one. That's all. Again, if you are implementing, you have to do it all. That's something that you have to always remember. You cannot just do a part of it and say the rest is, unless that's your intention. Unless you want this to be copied, and when it's copied, you want it to be defaulted. A again, if you are doing something, you have to do it all. You shouldn't let it be. And if you want to actually let the thing to be defaulted, it's a good idea to actually comment it. Because the next person, two years from now, looking at your code, will think, did he make a mistake or it was intentional? That's, that's where commenting comes through. OK? And it brings me to other things. I am reviewing students' code, and I see some of you are spamming your code with comments. OK? I, I know it's a for loop. You don't need to write. This is a for loop at the top of the thing. Really? OK. You, what you need to do, a very short, small thing at the top of your function that tells what this function is supposed And I taught you how. You put three slashes, and poof, it expands. You can write the summary and everything in the header file. OK? So. Please, uh, 
don't spam your code with, because it's really hard to walk through. And I have to try to find your code between all the English, okay? And it goes, really drives me nuts, please, okay? Uh, but yeah, if you, if you have like, for example, uh, you are writing a piece of code, then you are creating a hash table. And that's a very complicated thing to do. You're going to say, slash, slash, creating hash table. So ah, so that's what it's doing, okay? Since you don't know what a hash table is, then forget about it. But, what I'm saying, but you know what I mean, right? Uh, if you see something complicated is happening, tag it. Tag it, not, not the story of your life. Yesterday when I was walking in, don't do that, okay? Okay, thank you. Please comment, but don't over comment. So this one's going to be, uh, oops, I put a dot at the end. Damn it. Three hours and I put, oh, it removed the dot. Did it remove the dot? Oh, shoot. <laughs> OK, well, you know what, what it means. I'll, I'll fix it later on. OK. Uh, where is it? IPC 144. Good. OK. We were teaching pointers last time. I wanted to say, people, please come. It, it would be it, it, nice, actually. I, lots of 244 students need the pointer thingy to get refreshed. Actually, let's do. OK. Uh, five minutes break. And then we're going to come back. Uh, please remind me to resume recording. OK. I'm going to uh, mention something extremely important. Let me see how can I. So you're a manager of a coffee shop, OK? You hire somebody to clean up your table. You teach the person how to clean up the table. You tell them where the detergents and everything are, uh, detergents are, where, where the, uh, the, the napkins are, where the rags are, and everything, right? And then what do you do when you want the tables cleaned? Somebody. You tell the guy to clean up the table. Do you go get the rag and stuff to start cleaning up the table yourself? No. That's object-oriented programming. When you create a class, you make the class to do everything you're supposed to do. And you see in the next stage of your application, I am telling you to print that object. Don't print the guts of the object. You already taught the object how to print itself. Don't redo everything or clean up the table yourself. Call the guy to clean up the table for you. You just design the thing, train the guy and everything. That's object orientation. When you create a class and it's done and it passes all the tests, use the class. When somebody tells you, let the class do that, don't think how the class is supposed to do. Forget about it and trust if that the class is doing its job. If you did it and it doesn't work, don't change your code. Go fix the base class. Not the base class. Fix the class you created, the waiter. If you ask the waiter to clean up the table and you come back, the table's not clean, don't clean up the table. Go fix how the guy is supposed to clean up your table. OK? This is extremely important. I see over and over that I ask students to design a class. Then after it's, it's done, I'm going to say, let's say I have a, a transcript. And I'm going to say transcript has student name, it's Mark, and the GPA. Then I'm going to say print. And I'm going to say after it's done, I'm going to say and print the, 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 the student name, the Mark, and the thing in the transcript. I see they're going again through printing it. Don't do that. Just print the transcript. You have designed it already. OK? 
Please, that's very important. A mistake happens over and over, not with students who don't understand the concept. We people who, who came with A plus from C plus from C language. Move from structure, get into object oriented. Okay? It's very important. The design is supposed to be done in a way that everything becomes independent. They can do their work properly. Okay? And now the next part of the story. For this part, I'm going to introduce a couple of classes that I have written for testing. So I created two classes, uh, three classes actually. I'm going to put these three classes for you. You see what they are. I'm going to explain what they are. Class number one. Class number one. It's an interface. Displayer is an interface. What does it mean? It's an interface. Only pure virtual functions. And that's what it is. So a displayable is essentially what I would say by this. A displayable class is a class that can display itself. That's a perfect example for an interface. OK? I'm creating a class called container that is displayable, which means it has to implement the display. And also, I should have made it, uh, it's OK. And also, it can add itself to another. So it can actually it overloads the binary, uh, uh, binary uh, operator. So the contents of two to, so the contents of two containers are added. So instead, if I have container A and B, I add the, the, the data of the first container and second container, put it together in a third container, and return it. So a new container is generated by this. That's why it's constant. It doesn't change anything. That's my container. Very simple class. And I do not need to overload the op insertion operator because this playable know how to do, knows how to do it, and it's going to happen for everyone. The next class I created over here is a mark. Mark is a class that it has data. That is a mark that student receives. It has a constructor default. And, and a one argument constructor that sets everything properly. And then it has an operator plus over here that can, a one mark can be added to another mark. Obviously, two marks being added cannot grow more than 100. So if I have two 70% added together, that becomes only 100. But if it's lower than 100, the content's going to be that. And that's how the mark is added and it's returned. Obviously, mark will display itself. Are we okay with this? Right? So, that's that. Th those, those three classes, OK? Now, let's say I have series of integers and doubles. Series of integers and doubles. This is extremely important. Don't get distracted with your computer. That's why I hate computers in class. You have one language processor. Is that what I told you? You open that one in front of you. You gotta look at that, and you're not going to listen to me. Don't do it. OK? Integer A, B, and C, and double X, Y, and Z. So I have three integers and three doubles. Simple and straightforward, right? <coughs> If I want to, for, let's say for some reason, I want to display uh, the sum of two integers and return the value. So I create a function like this. So it re receives two integers, adds them up using a plus, puts it in the sum. Play some very simple function to deal with that integer thing. And then what I will do over here 
is to use it to display the sum of two integers if needed. Something like this. Are we okay with this? And I run the program, obviously it's going to display the sum of 10 and 20, and it's going to say sum is 30, display sum func to return 30, right? So the first line is display sum working, the second one is the value it's returning. Are we all okay with this? All right, now if I have, if I use the exact same thing, and this is important, please pay attention. Por favor, please. Do I need to write another function for double? It's going to work, although it's not going to be precise. I have 10.1 and 20.2, so the result is 30.3, right? 30 point, yeah, 30.3. So when I run the program, it still works. But obviously, it's going to say sum is the, so it works with float. Did I overload the function? No. How does it work? <laughs> Lamest type of polymorphism. Okay? Casting. It actually C. It's not C++. You run this program in C, it works perfectly. Okay? This is called casting, casting that looks like polymorphism. Okay? This type of polymorphism is called coercion. It's absolutely fake. There is no polymorphism over here. It's just the result of automatic casting. Are we okay with this? But then we learn C++. We say, hey, uh, uh, we can actually overload uh, a function. I can rewrite the function with doubles, right? Now, it's a polymorphic thing. If I run it, each function will be called properly, and as a result, I'm going to have a good thing coming up, and each one will going to boot. The other one is going to be 33.3, .3, and life is beautiful. And we call this polymorphism. Still, this is fake. It's not real. It's not polymorphism. Why is it fake? Because, come on. In the only thing they did, they, 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 to, to the compiler, they say just attach types to the name. So when you write this function, you write display sum. Compiler writes in its source code display sum int int. In its source code, write display sum double double, like the coffee, right? So what happens, the two functions are completely different name. One is display int int, the other one is display double double. When you are calling it, you are saying display int, it looks like it's int int, so the function that is called is display int int, therefore that one is called. So it looks like polymorphism when you are writing it, but when you look at it closely, it's not really there. Okay? This is still fake polymorphism. We call this overloading. Right? And that overloading can get extended to any object that has these features. As you just noticed, the two classes that I created, they support the plus operator binary, and they can be inserted into C out. I created that, right? And they have uh, all the things that it needs to have. So essentially, if I have a container over here, if I, if I had a series of containers and marks in here, if I have series of containers and marks, I could still have the two display functions. Because everything works with those things. And I can actually, and I can actually uh, use the exact same methodology, uh, the exact same function call for these two and have display sum called for those marks. And when I run the program, it works, runs the exact same way, absolutely no difference. So now I have the sum 30, sum 30.3. The other one is the sum of the two containers that is 300. And this one is sum of two marks that is 100. Because they are more than. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Scroll well. What, 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 what? Yeah, because marks, uh, uh, marks, uh, 
adding is not a simple one. Okay? In container, it just adds, but in mark, it doesn't. Are we okay? They are all working perfectly. Please. So this one is overloading, right? Did I run it? Let me run it one more time. Yeah. So let's call this Now I want you to pay attention. Look at the logic of these four functions. Do you see any difference between them? The logic is identical. What is different between these? Types, right? So you can ask your seven-year-old sister to write this code for you. You can simply just do this. You can do this and write over here, hee -haw. Okay? And tell to anyone, could you please copy that, replace all the hee haws with an integer? Poof. The function will get created for that. Of course, we're not going to call it hee haw. Okay? To make it make sense. We can call it anything we want. That's what I mean. Okay? I can leave it as hee haw to prove it to you, but it's, it's, it sucks, right? So, so it's, a, the better, it's better. It's like it's more customary to type, make type. Oh. To make them all type, right? So, so that's what it is. So essentially, now I can give it to anyone that says replace the type with an integer, and we're good, right? Replace the type with a double, and we're good. Replace the type with a mark, we are good. Why? Because mark satisfies all the things that I have in this logic, and the container the same. Okay? You can actually do that. So your seven-year-old uh, sister could be the compiler. You can actually say over here, template, type name, type, done. And now the compiler will write it for you. As soon as you say this, it, it's not, oh, I have the template for it. I'll create it. So it creates literally a new function for you on the fly that is int display int f int f. Then you call it as a container. Display some container container. It looks at it. Oh, it matches. I'm going to replace the type with the container. And it creates it. OK? So what is beautiful about this? In the last version, I had four, over, four overloads. Did you? That's, that's called a bug in a system. OK, four overloads, right? In the previous one, I had four overloads. If I only called one of them, what would happen to the other three? They would still get compiled and be in your executable, right? But in this one, if I don't, if I don't call the template, no function will even get created in my executable. I'm not going to have anything. That doesn't translate to anything. But as soon as I make the function call, then it's going to get created. And the good thing is that it's going to create it for everything. There is one catch for it. When you create a template like this, what you need to do is to heavily document it. This one cannot be just little thing. You have to really mention. So you have to actually put everything in there. Okay? You have to put a summary saying display sum finds the sum of two uh, types and returns it as a new type. And you mention that in a summary. Then in your parameter type, you have to mention that the type over there must support binary plus. Must. What are the things in here? What are the things in here it needs to do? Just think about it. Put your object-oriented hat and think about it. Number one, plus should happen, correct? Number two, it should be insertable into O stream. Number three, copy construction, because it's passed by value. And you have assignment at the moment of creation that receives another sum.
returns it by value, that's up to construction. So I need to actually tell that this thing needs three things. It needs, it needs to be copied properly. It needs to support uh, binary plus, And it needs to be insertable into O stream. Now you can use it for anything you want, anything. OK? And you write all those things. So in here, uh, you will write uh, uh, whatever. I cannot even write whatever. The type over here, I'm going to say copy uh, operator plus. Uh, what is the other one? Uh, insertion into, into O stream. And in here, you're going to say um, uh, general type, any, uh, any type, or just write type, and in here write type, and returns a new, new object of type. Okay? Now doing that, anybody just hovers over this, they're going to see exactly what it does. It gives the explanation, so when you actually do that, it shows exactly what needs to be done. These things do wonders, okay? Do that in your program. It's going to save your life three years, four years after you wrote the program. Because, you know, after a week of writing the program, that program is as if written by someone else. You don't remember what the heck you do. He just proved it to me right now, okay? So that's what I'm saying. Make sure you comment like this. I would really appreciate it instead of spamming everything everywhere, you can just put three slashes in front of the, with a class, you go to the header file, right at the top of the prototype of the header file, you put three slashes, and you explain what that function, that method is doing. That is amazing. It helps me as soon as I hover over it, it shows me exactly what's what, okay? That's the introduction to templates, okay? I'm going to, if we have time, and by the end of the semester, if we have time and we have m m classes that we can just not do anything in it, I'm going to have one session to prepare you for OP345, which I'm going to teach you class templates. This is function templates. The next day you are coming in, we're going to complete it uh, with uh, uh, telling you all the exceptions and how the templates are written, what does it mean specialization, of what does it mean overloading? If, what if I have an overload too? So I'm going to explain all the bells. And what if I need several different types over here? One type and two type and two. What, what happens? So all those things I'm going to explain. Uh, but then uh, we will see what happens. Uh, if we have extra time, we're going to go th through class templates. Why? Uh, I don't know if you remember a long time ago in Galaxy Far, Far Away, Apple had this slogan as an advertisement that it would say, you want to do this, whatever, there is an app for that. It would say, you want to do this, there is an app for that. You want to do accounting, there is an app for that. You want to go shopping, there is an app for that. It means everything has an app. Anything you want to do in C++, there is a template for it. Standard template library. It's a vast library that has logic written for you. You want to do binary search? There's a standard template library. You want to create hash table? There's a standard labor uh, template library. You want to have a binary tree? You want to have a balance tree? You want to have parallel processing done? You, anything you want to do, there is a standard template library for that. If you know how to use it, it gives you power to do things safely because the logic, the algorithm that is written within the belly of C++ is much more efficient and something that you're going to do with custom by yourself. Just be aware of that, OK? And that's end of the lecture today. Questions? Yes? Can I use type to create another function, or is it just for this function? I, I just put hee over there for you. You can do anything, anything no, you want. No, I mean the template that you write up. Oh, 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 and another thing that I have to mention, this template, always only covers the scope that is coming after. So if I have a second function, there is another template that has to get started. And it, usually it's a good idea to use type for all the things. But the problem is that when I put type, students think that it's supposed to be type. Then they go sample, somebody puts a capital T, and they get confused. That's why I put over there hee-haw. I really could put hee-haw over there, but it was just 
a little too funny and people will lose because this gets distracted. So type is yeah, the best thing to write. Okay? And usually doing templates happens like this. You write a piece of code and you see, wow, I can apply it to many different things. Then you convert it to a template. Okay? When you become a pro, you write a template from scratch. But if you're not, you write it for a general type. You test it. When it works, then you convert it to a template. Are we good? Are we okay, one? Because it is polymorphism. By definition, polymorphism is doing the same thing in a different way. It's no. It's doing the same thing in a different way. In C language, when you write A is equal to B plus C, that plus can have two integers, two doubles. So you are doing plus in many different ways. It is polymorphism. When I say fake polymorphism, it is polymorphism for everyone. What I'm saying behind the scene, it's not polymorphic. This is true polymorphism. Because you are saving the logic, and the logic is created for you based on uh, uh, on demand. Let's put it that way. So this is true polymorphism. There is no fake thingy behind it. Okay, and there is and also virtuality. When you have the exact same function, and automatic the proper one is selected, that's true polymorphism. And that's the last session of this semester. All different types of polymorphs, and you, now you know it. It's ad hoc and universal. Ad hoc means fake. Universal means real. Ad hoc has coercion and overloading. Universal has uh, uh, parametric, that is uh, templates. And the other one, I forgot. I have to take a look. The good thing is that you won't forget because you're going to be asking a quiz. I'll, I'll break the lecture for you at the time so you'll see. Okay? But that's essentially. You, that, that's why I want this thing to be done at the end of the semester. So because you have done all different types of it, then you understand exactly what they are. Okay? All right. What was the other one? Parametric and seriously far that? 